Hey, I'm he, he, and he goes in public. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what do you want to do? You're on. Oh, I'm on. Okay. I just I thought that was some good stuff. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. I'm just kind of babbling on here. Yeah, that's but what I'm... Paul said. Let him talk. Oh, okay. Because I'm I'm a little bit rusty. At, uh... Oh, we just talk about anything you want, you know. And and uh, are these are these uh, I just got these. Are, are they light enough for the interview? Yeah, they're going. Uh, they're, they look good. Otherwise, I can say I'm an aim leader. Yeah. I call it aim. You know, they're kind of like a Elks Club now, and and they, yeah, I call them that '70s show. So I played at a <laughs> banquet they had in Oakland, their 40th anniversary. This is a few years ago, and I see these guys because they were like 40ish when I was in my 20s, and I went up there, and the first thing I said was, uh, "Welcome to Jurassic Park," and it was great. But what was sad was seeing all these pictures of people and group shots and how many are not with us anymore. And, you know, that that was sad too. And and those guys, they uh, took a lot of blows. They, they made a lot of mistakes. But also, they raised an awareness that, and, and pride that we still have now. People don't give them credit for that, you know. So so I got to give it up for that. And, and I trained doing the... Yeah, that's good. Playing in, in shit clubs and aim benefits, and when I would do an aim benefit, it would be a bullhorn on the back of a porch or wherever Indians put up. So when I go to a lousy <laughs> nightclub, it looked like a palace to me. But so so that that was it. And uh, I knew all those guys, and they were all friends of mine. So uh, as even if, if they made the mistakes, what have you, they, they at least they took a shot. And I wish young people would do that now today. It doesn't have to be armed struggle or nothing. Because the consciousness is different, but there's, you can still do things, you know. The kids got more access to different kind of media now that they didn't have, you know. Yeah. So that's that's part of the learning experience going on, you know. So. Yeah, that, that's one thing I was going to mention. I saw the um, Native Comedy Jam or whatever it was. Oh, yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. And then I noticed a lot of your material, you had some, uh, there's political Mm -hmm. undertones or edge or you know pretty outright statements about you know native um politics uh being a native and then uh so and i and you said dick gregory was one of your yeah. ma main influences yeah. so what what would you be able to say about um to young people about about that kind of um the need for that kind of um, consciousness. Oh, I, I would just say um, versus the MTV that we see yeah, kids yeah. into. Well, they, Floyd used to say, "Give them games of playing wine to drink, and they won't ask the right questions." So a lot of people are, are kind of dumbed down. You don't see people protesting the war like we did. You don't see people; they're almost kind of like complacent with it. And I think if they start drafting people, then you're going to see hell raised. But but I think that consciousness is just ready to brew out and expand again. I really I really believe that and I feel that. What I like about being around so long was this this lap around. There's a whole new generation that wasn't. They didn't know who I was, and so I'm new to them, and I love that. <laughs> I, I I I like it's it's like when the white kids discovered all those blues guys because they heard the Stones records. It was like. When they discovered Floyd Westerman, they didn't know he was a singer for our generation. When he started singing and playing, it was like, wow. So there's that. So there's increments of people saying things and doing things, but we need a lot more. And people are just kind of afraid and stuff. And and it's time to come out there. I, I think uh, when I became a comedian, I watched Dick Gregory and he was such an activist. I said, that's what I want. And then when I was 18, Vine Deloria's book, Custer Died for Your Sins, came out. And I saw him on the Dick Cabot show, and I thought, wow, this guy's the real deal. He was wearing a t-shirt and jeans, and he was so funny, and his humor was real biting. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, when he uh, was out there, he had the facts to back it and everything. If he wasn't around, I, I still would have been a comedian, but I probably would have been like, like a Bill Cosby kind of thing, like safe humor and all that. Uh, so I remember when I was 18, when I dropped out of college, the first of many times, I came back here and I, I wanted to be a comedian. It was like a secret wish. 
and, and I and I thought there's nobody I know in the business, none of my family, and I thought I'm gonna make myself do this. I'm gonna find a way. And I went to that table right there. I was 18 years old, and I wrote down every joke I knew. Just, just, I, and and I wanted it so bad, and I felt this kind of a warm swelling in my gut. I've only told a few people this, and it was like it was real strong for a few minutes. I never had that again, but I think it was like. I, I I put that out there and I got it back. That's what I wanted to do, and and from then on I would listen to comedy albums and study them, watch comedians, and I would take notes for years. When I was in New York in the Native American Theater Ensemble, when we weren't doing anything, I would go down to the Village or upstate New York and watch the comedians and ask questions. And I met Jay Leno and I met Richard Belzer. Everybody was talking about Freddie Prinze and. But I never met him until I got to L.A. So that's what I wanted to do, but I never said that to anybody. It was a secret wish. You know, that's okay. That's cool. The jobs are coming in, brother. Uh, hello. <laughs> you can edit this, right? Mm -hmm. Hold on, Cedar. Uh, yeah, it's down. You know that little silver cabinet in the middle of the kitchen there? That little silver shelf? Where where I'm ha where the measuring cups and stuff hang on? You know that little next to the dishwasher. The, yeah, the the little silver shelf. Right on the bottom, on the very bottom, you'll see it. It's a it's a red and yellow can. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the brand name on it is, but it's that canoe. Yeah, no, it's all, all the way on the bottom. Uh, all right, I'm doing an interview down here in Oneida, so I'll be back soon. All right, bye. <laughs> My daughter. How old is she? 24. Goes she, quick, doesn't it? Yeah, she just graduated from Madison a couple weeks ago. Oh, May good for her. Yeah. What, uh, you got grandkids? One, yeah. How old? He'll be five in August. I had my first one a month ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, girl. congratulations, thank Grandpa. You, thank you. What I like about being a Grandpa, now, you know, I've always said what I wanted, but now I can say anything to anybody, anywhere, often on stage, and own it, because I'm a Grandpa. <laughs> and I can, I can just bitch and moan, and, and I love it. I just love it. So, <laughs> so we'll put it on. We'll keep firing away. Here. Oh, it, I left yeah. it going. Oh, oh good, good. <laughs> so, uh, that's what I love about being a Grandpa, and, and plus... Uh, that was kind of my wish. I figured when I get to be an older comic, then I can really let it go. Um, I, I found with the comedy, uh, a lot of people, and I said this in our special, it's the last one of the last bastions of freedom of speech and nobody's using it. So when we put that Showtime thing together, I was executive producer, and I always wanted to do a, uh, a show in front of a native crowd on TV. Uh, if you see George Lopez, he always got the Latinos, and the white comics always have their crowd, and Chris Rock has his crowd. So I, I want, you know, so the L.A. Indian community came out to it. So we got to put it together, and, and uh, the, there's a group of guys who call themselves the powwow comedians. I call them four guys who want to be Charlie. Because <laughs> if you watch them all, they all kind of do a version of my show. And in a way, it's real flattering, though, because I learned watching uh, Richard Pryor. You know, Richard Pryor. Can, is this a? Can this? Do you have to censor this? Because it's it's on. I can say what I want, right? You can say. Well, I'm a grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> so I met Richard Pryor, and that was my idol. And he saw me do my act, and he came up to me and he gave me a big hug. He says, "You talk to these white people like they're dogs." We got to get together, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, wow, Richard Pryor. Next day, he takes me to the movies, takes me to his house, and he had an incredible respect for Indian people. And then he said to me, uh, you ever been on TV? I said, no, I'm just starting out. He said, I'll get you on. And a couple years later, he had the Richard Pryor show, and he kept his word. And I thought, wow. You know, and then right to the end, he always had a spot for me. Near the end, I'd watch... Uh, uh, boxing with him. He was bedridden with MS, and I would go see him, but he was the best he, of all time. There's nobody close to him. If you see the Kings of Comedy, Richard did it by himself. He didn't need a group, you know. 
And and I wanted to do my own for showtime, but I figured if this is the way I can get in now, then we'll do it. And what I liked about having all these other native guys on was uh, they never heard our voice. They think there's only one voice for Indians, so everybody's got different things to say and do. And, and, and they all have different styles, and that's what I liked about it. So it took us a while to get it on the air, and, and I'm real happy when my friends see it. That, that makes me feel good, you know. Uh, um, I, I just remember wanting to do that for a long, long time. And uh, every now and then I still get on Letterman. David puts on the old school people that he knew. And when I started at the comedy store, I was in line with him and a, a young guy named Mike Douglas who changed his name to Michael Keaton because there was another Mike Douglas and, and the actor Michael Douglas. And when I came in the comedy store, that was my education. And I was there with the best of the best. Uh, oddly enough, the woman named Mitzi Shore, she was a Green Bay native. So when I, I auditioned there, she says, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from Oneida, Wisconsin. She said, well, I'm from Green Bay. And I thought, we hit it off right from there. And Mitzi always let me do what I wanted on stage. Um, when I started playing in some clubs, uh, a lot of people are offended with language. People were offended by me, by my point of view. You know, yeah, they didn't want to hear the Indian point of view. I remember some idiot in a casino in Minneapolis, or, or somewhere upstate Minnesota. He said, do you just do native material? I said, well, I can do others, but it's, it's easy. And he was kind of implying, don't do native material. I said, would you tell James Brown not to sing R&B? I said, that's such racist, colonialist thinking. And so I always took the approach was, this is our land, I'm the landlord, and I will say what I damn please. This is what I'm going to do. And I also got that inspiration from Buffy St. Marie. Uh, I met her at the Indian Center in 1975, and I said, can I ask you something? So we go outside. I said, I'm learning how to be a comedian. I just want some advice. And I think she took to me because I didn't ask her for something. And also, on my mom's side, I'm Cree, like Buffy. And and so she took to me right away. She says, well, give me a tape of your what you're doing. So I sent it to her. And a week later, she calls me up, and she talked to me about two hours. She gave me so much inspiration. And and then she came back to L.A., and I got to open for her, and I had maybe ten minutes of material. Then I saw her again. We did a thing at the penitentiary for the Wounded Knee guys. Everybody was in there but the leadership. <laughs> That's where I met Mark Paulus and Herb Paulus. They were in there. I never met them before, and they're from here. And I'm going, Jesus, I'm homies in here. But each time I saw Buffy, she saw how serious I was with it. So as time went on, we've done hundreds of shows together. Canada, U.S., TV shows. A real giver. She really is. She's the kind of person, when you're around her, she inspires you. Whether you're a photographer, writer, whatever you do, it just she brings out the best in you. Cause she gets, some people inform and some people transform. And she does that. She transforms people. And, and I owe her a big debt. An, another huge... Uh, inspiration I was lucky to be around of course was uh, Vine Deloria that I mentioned and he was on me for years to write a book he said I'll help you edit it and on and on and I was a real you know I, I was kind of dabbling at it for a long time and then the last time I saw him he hung around three days because I played in Tucson and he gave me kind of an outline to follow and he recorded my actions maybe we can get a couple chapters off of this and I, and I was real fussy how I'm going to write it. He said, just write it, just write it, you'll find it. And I found out later, he hung around those days just for me. I found out that there's a lot of people who want to work with him, but he was real choosy. So I was real honored that he looked at me that way. Also Buffy. And, and when he crossed over, I regret not doing that. But someone said he still can help me. And I like that, that's the Indian way, he just, because wherever he is... And plus, he inspired people in all walks of life, not just writing. And he was a real giant. And the other one was Floyd Westerman. I was real blessed to have him and Vine as my mentors and Buffy. And Floyd taught me the harmonica. And I said, Floyd, you sing about the, you sing about the stuff I talk about. And he goes, yeah, well, we're all going down the same path. And what I liked was he really had that activist bent. That's how he talked, wasn't it? 
Yeah, well, Derek Dale, you got something there, yeah. <laughs> I got I got to stop. <laughs> Wait, I think I got it framed up here, but... Uh, yeah, I can't hold a camera and laugh. Shit. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know about this show. I think Paul probably mentioned it to me, but someone says Internet or Computer, that far as the conversation goes, because I, I don't know how to use one. And I, I'm kind of refusing, but I see what a huge tool it can be. I, um, but I see people, you go to a campus, everybody's got their cell phone on or their iPod or their, their what is it, a blueberry, blackberry, I don't know what the hell it is. But it, to me, it seems like too much of that's a disconnect from reality. People don't sit down like we're talking right now. You don't see that much. You don't see families sitting at, at dinner at the table together like we grew up doing. And not enough of it anyway. So I know oh, I'm getting on. yeah yeah. I know I'm getting old because I got all these opinions now. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to frame up my shot. Mm -hmm. Crap. It's okay. Yeah, that's how. How you did Floyd real dead? You <laughs> nailed it. I wonder. If that's uh, like a blower, air conditioner kind of thing. What do you need? I could set my camera. Whatever right. you want to do, Ben. If it don't fall off, you're welcome to do it. Yeah. If I can get you something else. This is, this is your... Uh, it kind of blows air around the room. When I first came here... Your high-tech interview. Two weeks ago, it was cold out. And I put that on. I thought it was a heater. And then the next day, it's 90 out. So it changed. Let me see what else I can find for you here. Well, See, that's kind of... Will it stay on there? Yeah, it should. As long as I'm not too rough. I don't know, that's a nice camera. I don't want it to fall down. There, there it goes. Really? Yeah. Oh. Are you comfortable? I make a good living. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I saw you at the airport in Albuquerque, that really made me feel good. There you are. Yeah. You're, you're, I got you. Okay, so am I looking in there or looking at you? Let's see. Let's. I want to see how it looks. Okay, look over here at me. Okay. Another thing is that big chair there, that's higher up, and we can turn it around and bring it here. It won't fall off. You know, that's one thing we can do. This one, too. Yeah, that one, too, maybe. It's the same chair, isn't it? Well. Let's see, it might fall off the top. Bumping record yeah. button. <laughs> so we're rolling now? We are. Okay. Yeah. I got the obligatory um, native blanket interview shot. Good. <laughs> you, see, you see Floyd and John Trudell and a lot of them photos mm -hmm. I done with the star quilt background. And oh, yeah, yeah. John, when I was in a Native American theater ensemble in New York City, John would hang with us, sometimes travel with us, and he was real inspired because we did a lot of spoken word to music. And by then, he was the chairman of AIM. And we related to him because he was younger than those other guys. Those other guys were hardcore guys that came out of the joint, and they, they did what they could. But John came from San Francisco, and, and he said he was the flower child. So his, his mindset was different than those guys. And then... Uh, when he took his own direction, became an, he said writing the poetry, he said that saved his sanity because when he lost his family, he didn't know what to do and he kind of became self-therapy for it. But he used to come to my house a lot in L.A. We'd hang out and we'd talk and smoke and joke and he said, I'm, I'm writing this stuff and I'd like to perform it. Later on, he said he wanted to act. So he's one of these guys that will say something and do it. A lot of people talk a good game. And John, what acting he's done in the films, he did well. He didn't embarrass himself like a lot of guys will get on. They look so foolish. You know, when I seen Russell Means in Last of the Mohicans, that's like watching Malcolm X in a Tarzan movie. It's like erosion of credibility. Jesus. So, so, uh, uh, so people get hired for their notoriety or how they look instead of their, their artistic talent. And, uh, with, uh, are you still rolling here? Mm -hmm. All right. I want to talk about patriotism a little bit. I got mixed feelings about it. Before it was just blunt, 
one way or another. I think Indian patriotism is a form of Uncle Tomism. I think when you salute that American flag, that's the highest form of codependency and abuse. Because it's like, how many times can you keep going back to something that betrayed you and lied you and ripped you off over and over? And so when Indians get into patriotism, I, I respect, as I got older, people who want to believe in that. But on the same note, respect me for my belief. Because there's a lot of us that don't support that. They're not fighting for um, freedom in, in Iraq. They're fighting for oil. And it's bullshit when they're talking about freedom. And when America talks about spreading freedom and giving freedom, Indian people were always free. Always. And way before Americans even thought of it. So that being said, America has nothing to give us because we've already been free. I think it's a part of what, why they resent us. And Indians, as poor as we are, we're the freest. I think that's why we come in an Indian time and we do what we want, wherever we want. It doesn't matter if we're rich or poor. There's that part of us that's always in, the, in there. Uh, there's that spirit that we have when we're together. The Floyd Westerman once told me after a party, a concert, or a gathering, People always want to go out later. They want to go to a bar or a restaurant or someone's house. He said, because we latch on to the spirit, we don't want to let it go. And I thought, that's so true. You know how that feeling is. You just don't want it to go. And and Indians don't go out just to have a drink or something. They bop till they drop. Because it's, it's that freedom. We let it go. Indians laugh harder at things than anybody because we're free. We're free. There's a whole thing to that. Um, getting back to the patriotism... I think um, there's different levels of it as I got older. Someone once told me that when the Lakotas uh, beat Custer, they took his flag. Nobody ever did that to the U.S. military to this day or before. They took that flag and they made it their flag. And so when, when the Indians salute the flag coming from that point of view, that's their flag or our flag. That's because we took it. And and nobody ever, ever that fought America did that before or since. And so when Indians look at it, that's our flag, our land. And, and when somebody told me that, I start looking at it a little different. So Americans can salute that, but they're saluting an illusion of what they think it is. So I, I kind of like that point of view. I also like, they do have that warrior thing about defending their country. Uh, I think in World War One. When, when the Iroquois and the Hopis and everybody who went to war, we weren't even citizens, but we went as allies because this is our land that we're protecting. It doesn't matter. These, these uh, I call them indigenously challenged. That's what American people are. It's, uh, like they're special. Yeah, you, you got that right. I, mean, <laughs> I, met, I met a Harvard graduate yeah. who asked me if we still lived in teepees. Yeah, Harvard grad. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah, I, know. I don't know. I must have stood there five minutes, like, <laughs> like stumbling out. Uh, what? What? I, it was. Uh, it was absurd. It was so absurd. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Americans are st stuck on stupid when it comes to Indians. And Floyd used to say, "If America will never get right till they get right with the Indians," you know. And they did this half-ass apology right now, and it's like. It's like that commercial and that, that beer commercial that co coach is going, playoffs? Playoffs? You're talking about playoffs? So I'm going, apology? Apology? It's like they stole the whole Western Hemisphere and they're going, oops, my bad. You know, like, like and that's okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's bullshit. It really is. Um, when people ask us things, like, you know what goes on in America when Obama's trying to get health care, they think, uh, Oh, they got to legislate it. They got to legislate civil rights, legislate um, Medicare, health for the elders, uh, helping people of color. Uh, all these things they have to legislate, which should be just normal human decency, because that's out of their. They're not wired to be that way, or sharing. Uh, uh, so I think I call that indigenously challenged. They're, they're just indigenously challenged. They don't get it. They don't get it. And as much as we try to educate them, and we try so hard, sometimes I wonder, will they ever get it? You kind of wonder, because they're really stuck on stupid. If people have been in America all these years, 
and we've been right in their faces all this time. They know nothing about us. How can they not look at their science, their history, their medicine in the same myopic way? If they don't know us, how the hell are they going to go around the world tell other people how to live? And they don't even know how to teach themselves how to live here. Vine Delirious said our job is to teach America how to act human. And I always like that. So, so uh, there's this, you know, sometimes you meet some of these uh, what, 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 white, white people <laughs> that they, um, some of them are real free, but they're lost among all the other ones. They're, 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 you don't see them, but when they're out there, they have a lot of courage to stand up with us. And I'm talking about that ones that support us without trying to be wannabes, the ones that really, really go to bad for us. And they're out there, but, but you got to look for them. And I'm not talking about those earth muffins, those tree huggers, those, uh, what's that idiot? Uh, he made the sweat lodge. And he killed all these people. Yeah, now he's up for manslaughter. Now he's really sweating. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I saw that guy give a workshop in L.A. long ago. I'm trying to think his name now. But he uh, he didn't talk about native things or sweats. So I think he went to a native sweat and a lot of these New Agers, if you take them to a sweat, they'll follow you around for two years. So now you see it on TV as Sweat Lodge Defendant. I never heard that term before. Sweat loud survivor. I mean, Jesus. So now, like I'm saying, he's up for manslaughter, so he, now he's really sweating. But, uh, they, you know, do you ever get 60 people? I used to say, what do you get when you put 60 white people in the sweat? You get about a half a million dollars. That's what you get. <laughs> so, uh, 9,000 bucks these idiots paid to go in there. And I'm thinking, wow, they're just so spiritually bankrupt. They're looking for it. So I'm thinking, I wish I'd met those people. I would have said, you know, you give me a thousand bucks, I'll give you the right to say, aho, aho. Or you want to smudge, that's 500 bucks. You know, I mean, Jesus, idiots. That's part of being indigenously challenged. They just they just don't get it. And, uh, you know, so when we talk about stuff, they think we're being angry or hostile. Um, and I say, well, black people are angry, Indians are labeled hostile. I remember being a student in Madison, and uh, when the black students would get together because they didn't have African-American studies, they would put in the paper, angry, there was a near riot on campus today because angry black people got together and it's like, whoa. And then when we wanted our own thing and we'd play the drum and try to wake awareness, there were hostile war drums today at the state capitol and I'm going, Jesus Christ. I also remember in college, uh, we're all in a bar, this is back in Stout, in the the frat girls and sorority girls and the frat guys they're singing their songs and the sorority girls are singing their their thing and the, and the frat boys you know we are the gay boys from Theta Chi whatever they sing so we started our you know in 49 and and we're doing what they're doing but our version and once we started that two cops came back with their hands on their on their pistols to see was there any trouble so uh, if you're in any kind of urban area Get out that drum, then the cops come. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, man. So uh, I think American people, indigenously challenged, they're afraid of us because we're still the unknown to them. We're right in their faces and they know nothing about us. We're right in their faces, they're still studying us. I mean, geez, 500 years, you think they'd get it. And, and uh, so all that stuff, that's a wealth of material for me. And my job I always took was people laugh with us instead of at us. I see other native <laughs> I think Keith God. is really the, the the real deal. I think he's the heir apparent to Floyd. He's got his own style, but he's a real creative native and Indian cars is like almost an anthem for Indian rock music. And each time he records it he'll record it like a, a rock song, then he'll do it again as a, a punk song, then he'll do it as a reggae song. He keeps changing it, and I love that, you know. And I remember when he was a student at Boulder. That, that's what I like about being around so long. I've seen all these people grow and blossom. I did a show in Toronto years ago. Gary Farmer was my sound man, and the lighting guy was Graham Green. And uh, I thought, boy, that's a long time ago. And I remember Adam Beach was, uh, I met him when he was 16. And uh, you could turn, I don't know if that goes on, but try it. And he, uh. Yeah, oh, I was just yeah, feeling yeah, nice yeah. glass. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, I just seen him coming out of the shoots, and that's kind of cool. 
so I like to see these people grow, and I like to see them just just excel what they are. I've seen a lot of people when I came to LA uh, pretend to be Indians, and 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 it doesn't. You know, when people do this wannabe shit, don't they realize we can tell? You know, Dale, can you can you imagine you wanting to be a Swiss or Italian or Jewish? And you take on that persona and you go to their communities and try to live there. And how much mental energy they must take and somewhat denial. So when they do that around Indians, don't don't they know we can tell? Yeah. <laughs> well, I used to do in my act was, remember the village people? Remember them? Young man, let me show you a trick. I say, young man, put your hand on my... Remember the village people? <laughs> One guy's a cop, one guy's a sailor, construction worker, a sailor, and one guy's an Indian. And I go, Indian's not an occupation, you know? <laughs> and then I would say, unless you're Ward Churchill. Now let your uh, grandpa now, Charlie, yeah. and your, yeah. your coming of age here. Um, what what do you feel about that, uh, the living in two worlds that that we have to do, you know? We, we got the... the, the mainstream society that a lot of us have to function in on a right. daily basis we got to go to work because we have bills yeah and things like that we got uh, children to feed and, and things like that and a home to maintain and then we got uh, our our native existence and uh, we got hides we could be out there tanning you know yeah and 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 going out gathering and how how is it, how can we how can we um, work how can we how can we survive living that way? Well, it seems like we have survived it, and it's like you could go too far one way and forget when you get down to to living in the city way. You know, I grew up in both. I lived in Detroit as a little kid and as a res when I got a little older. So as I grew up, I got to be in both worlds. I I I, I love being in New York City. But I also in Minneapolis in other cities, but I also got to be on the res or got to be in the desert or home here. Got to have both. You got to have the balance. I think our parents did it, and and our grandparents did it. And of course, I do it. If I if I didn't have the city experience, I probably would never became a comedian. So I think you you turn those things and make it your own, and and you go in and out. And getting back to the patriotism, some elder told me. Uh, it's okay if Indians get into that warrior mode and support it. And like I'm saying, I have a lot of respect for the vets. I don't respect the military or, or the government, but I respect the vets because they're native people. And sometimes when the Indians wear that uniform and they put their own spin on it with a feather or a, or a beret, it looks better on them. I really believe that. I, I think it looks good when those guys wear that and I support all that stuff. So, but... There's there's that, and then you can go too far with it, and you become American patriots, and you forget you're native. That's that's the line we got to watch. There's that because the worst rednecks in the world are your own people. And yeah, I defended that flag, and da 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 da. And Richard Pryor used to do a bit about an old black man going, uh, "Yeah, we fought the Indians," and he go, "Shut the fuck up! You want the Indians to hate us too?" <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's like, uh, um, uh, I don't know, I just find as I got older, I got more to talk about. When I, when I started, it was more, more blunt, but I had to learn how to do it. So, so I would get my recorder and take my act and I'd listen to it. And I'm going, is this, they don't get it, the, the white crowds, because they don't have the experience? Or is it too intimidating, or is it just not funny? And often it would be the third thing. If something is funny, then it crosses over, and people get it. And to me, it doesn't matter if you're Indian or white. It's a matter if you have a sense of humor. Because I met some real free white people that really support me. And then I've seen some Indians that, what my daughter calls, non-Indian Indians. And and it's like, an Indian mind is a terrible thing to waste. It's like you see some Indian people, and they all... I've had people would apologize to their white friends about what I did on stage. I go, that is so sad. That <laughs> oh, God. Oh. I'm so embarrassed.
Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember doing something for some business convention that was half whoa, 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 white people and half Indians. And I'm in the hotel room and my the banquet's in the evening. And this guy calls me up. He says, "We'd like you to come down down here. We want to go over your speech." I said, "What the hell is this? High school? What the hell? You know?" So I go down there, and it was one one non-Indian Indian and four wha, 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 white people, and and I knew I knew it was bothering them. I'm going to make them say it, and they're kind of tiptoeing around it, and then one guy blurts out, "Are you offensive?" And I said, "Well, people offend themselves, you know, and and I don't define myself by your standards, but I got all their names down, and when I did my act, I just reenacted that meeting. That was my act." And the, the other the other thing was, uh, I did a version of it once. I was at the BIA and they had me play there. And and uh, before I went on, they had some anthro talk about what Indians are. Then I went on, and oh, it was I always call that it, it was a sellout crowd because it was most sellouts, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, before I went on, this Indian woman comes backstage. She says, "Well, we got a a list here of things you can say or not say." I said, what do you mean? And and she says, well, my boss gave me this. So I said, so? And then she says, then we'll get you backstage and you can change. I was wearing my AIM t-shirt and just to show my, my uh, contempt for the BIA, I was, you know, I said, this is it. This is what I'm wearing. I don't get dressed up for you guys. So they sent back this Bryant Gumbel type of Negro. And, well, you, you can't say any four-letter words. I said, you mean like love? My name is Hill. And, and don't make fun of the president. It was Clinton then. And I said, well, Letterman and Len will do it every night. And you, want, you don't want some little Indian boy saying something? And he just walked around saying these things to me. And I says, you know what? It's, it's because it's the White House. He says, he says we, we won't go there with that. And so I, I, I went out there with that list you gave me. And that evolved. And what I do now is my top ten list. I, and and he didn't think I was going to do that, and that's what I did. And I remember that's when Ada Deer was uh, head of the BIA, and she really supported me. And and uh, all the BIA women that were there really liked the act, and the men were walking around apologizing for me, you know. And I'd see these people. So where are you from, Oklahoma? You get home much? Oh, I ain't been home in twenty years. And I'm going wow. It's like so. There's a disconnect from reality. You don't know, you know. So, and almost everybody there is from Oklahoma, and and my father told me once about that. He said because there, they don't have a sense of sovereignty because there's no reservations there. So so, a lot of them by and large just want to be brown Americans or Christian, and an Indian mind is a terrible thing to waste. Well, no wonder we don't get much in health care or education with them yeah. guys uh, yeah. pulling the strings. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. also when they paid me, uh, they, they had to go around the chain to command. Nobody knew who, who was going to take care of it and how they're doing it. And I'm thinking, if these idiots can't deal with me, how do they deal with something really important? Like like the things you're talking about or... or just another nation. How do they do that? Where it's just organized mediocrity and, and chaos. So, so um, you know, I, I just think uh, I remember as a uh, young comedian, my dad always said, attack the bureau. And Vine said the same thing, and Floyd did. And it's like people get institutionalized, and they they forget they, they really do. And uh, I don't know. It's it's just uh, it's I I like what Buffy told me once, and Floyd. As performers, we're very, very blessed because we get to travel around Indian country and we meet all the movers and shakers in the communities and we get an, a special education just by being around it. So that's, that's and we see the healers and, and that's what I like about it. That's, that's what's been a nice journey for me. There's been times in my life where I'd be with my, my family out west and I remember being a young guy and in the morning, getting a blessing from my father-in-law in the Hogan. Then that night, I'm playing in the dunes in Las Vegas. And we're talking about the two worlds. That's really a different thing, you know. So so we all kind of do it. But if you're rooted and grounded in where you're from, 
then you can go anywhere and come back with it. That, that's what I think. You know, um, we we if we we take the you know people think. Uh, I remember this Gallagher, this uh, comedian. He said to me, uh, "Well, so uh, you guys don't want modern conveniences or this and that." I said, "It ain't about that." And it gets back to that Harvard guy. They're just stuck on stupid. They really don't know shit about us. And and when we bring it up or say something, uh, they think we're uh, being real angry instead of saying a matter of fact. I was with Buffy once and Floyd and the great late Will Sampson. We're up in Canada to support, I forgot what the deal was, but we went up to Saskatchewan. And we're talking about Indian things while these reporters in the room. And we say things just like you and I are talking. And they never heard this. They were just like, whoa. And then they interviewed Buffy, and she's always cool, and, says, and, and just a balance to her. And so we're watching the news to see how the interview's going to go, and it starts out, Today, Buffy St. Marie declared war on Canada. She didn't even... <laughs> so uh, this is what we're doing. What I, what I like is being a comedian. It's I'm like a mockingbird. I don't say anything that people didn't say before. I just put a little funny spin on it. I, I kind of learned that watching others. Bill Cosby does something called "Ooh Yeah" humor, because when you watch him talking about kids or something, "Ooh Yeah Yeah," because he's holding that mirror up. So that's what I learned how to do. Anything I said, your dad probably said it or my dad, and I just kind of just put a little comic twist on it. And, and so there's an endless source of material, you know. So I don't know. I don't know how much you're going to use of this, or maybe you can make it part one or two. Yeah, or uh, that's what <clears throat> I usually leave it up to them guys. I don't do too much of it. I'll put it in a raw form, and then yeah. they'll they'll put the credits on yeah. sometimes, or sometimes they'll have to take a little bit out here and there. But yeah, for time wise and all that. <clears throat> so I I also got a source of material from news from Indian country over the years. But he said whatever you want to do, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He said let them talk. Yeah, and and. Uh, Paul and I have long discussions about things over the years, and I known him back when he was, geez, he was working for the governor. Yeah. I remember that. I forgot the governor who he was. Tony Earl. Oh yeah, and then around here we used to call, uh, we used to call him uh, Benson because there was a TV show at the time that yeah. guy worked for the governor. So Paul was doing that, but uh, I think uh, I, I always supported that paper. I always liked it, and it writes about stuff. I don't see it very much now. Uh, but I'd like to. I mean, there are places you could get it, and now you can't get it. But, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's on the Internet. That's right. But once again, to me, I the Internet is like the talking wire. We didn't trust it at first. And they call people like me holdouts. But I see what a great tool it is. And, and you, you know, you can write your material on it, and you can put it this way and that. But I, I have yet to do it. And uh, I just got my first cell phone about a year ago. And to me, it was like having that electric, that electronic bracelet when, when, it, when you're on probation, because people know where you are. But you can't make a call anymore. So I find it's handy <laughs> when you want to know where your loved ones are, your family, or you're stranded at an airport, your car breaks. So I have to, I have to do that. I, I used to go nuts because Floyd would never get off his cell phone. I didn't have one back there, and he'd be on the phone and he'd hold it like this, like a walkie-talkie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey Vernon, how you doing? You know, and 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 it would just drive me nuts. So after he he passed away, Max Gale got me a cell phone, and he actually said, "Well, now you can call Floyd." I thought that was so funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um. Well, they called Geronimo a holdout too. He was a holdout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'd heard he was so powerful, and he had, he he was really a medicine man. And he could actually, you know, when you see on Star Trek, people can transport themselves. He could do that. And my wife told me that's how the Navajos evaded Kit Carson. We had, and some of that's in that book that Vine wrote, his last book, The World We Used to Live In, or I forget the title, right? But that stuff's in there, and we, we knew those things. And and he said ceremonies today, people just do it like a walkthrough. They forget how strong these things really are. But, but Geronimo knew all these things but he couldn't find anybody he trusted enough to teach that to when he when he when he passed on, you know. And my favorite Geronimo thing is my grandma, uh she was born in eighteen seventy six, 
and she lived in Philadelphia. She was adopted by Quakers, and she became the first Native woman physician in this country. I didn't know her because I was an infant when she passed. So she had met Ger Geronimo at the World's Fair, I think 1909 or something. And, you know, that's when they put him on exhibit, and he knew how to write his name. Actually, he drew it because he didn't write. But somewhere in our family archives, we got his autograph. But when you tell people, I got Geronimo's autograph, they 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 don't believe it. And you know, why would you have Geronimo's autograph? You know, and uh, my other favorite Geronimo story was Chuck Connors played him in a movie, and Chuck is six foot five and blue eyes, the whole deal. I got a lot of material from it. So one day I'm in uh, Las Vegas and I did my act. Then I'm in the restaurant and this big uh, white guy comes up to me. He goes right in my face and he goes, Geronimo was my father. I said, what? You know, because we hear the Cherokee thing. I says, what? And then he started laughing. He says, Chuck Connors, man, it's my dad. And I started laughing. And the guy sat down for a while and we talked. And I says, I love Chuck Connors as Geronimo. I mean, as a rifle man. But that Geronimo didn't make it. And he says, yeah, his dad thought the same thing. And I said, it must have been great your dad was the rifle man. And he said he was proud that his dad was on TV. But his dad was proud of, he was on the Boston Celtics. He was the first guy ever to tear down the backboard. You know, remember people were doing that? He was there in the 50s. He also played on the Dodgers for a brief time. And his son was in the minor league system who I met. And so he said he always thought himself as a ball player who got lucky. And and we just hit it off really well. About a week later, I got an 8x10 autographed picture of him on a galloping pony with a wig on as Geronimo. He said, this is me at 45. You Indians never look so good. <laughs> then he wrote down, I heard I'm part of your act. Well, good luck. And Chuck Connors, and I heard he had, he had a real good sense of humor of himself. But uh, if you watch it now, you can't go through 10 minutes of it about laughing hysterically because it's so off. Yeah. And then, and then they made Geronimo with West Studi. And they made Geronimo for that time period younger than he actually was. But, but Wes, um, when, when he first got the part, I met these uh, Cherokees who happened to be Indians. They were elders from where he's from. And I said, you know Wes Studi? Yeah, we know him. These his old ladies. I said, he just got signed to play lead in Geronimo. Woman goes, well, he's sure ugly enough. And I thought, Jesus Christ, Indian people, we got to learn to say congratulations. It doesn't exist with us. <laughs> but when Wes did it, he had like fourth building. Here he had the title role. It was Gene Hackman and all these white actors and then Wes. And he had the title role. And I told Wes, you know, when they had Free Willy, the whale got top billing and you didn't, you know, but that's, that's Hollywood. But Wes, uh, he kind of balanced out so he can do contemporary parts and 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 the guy in the horse, so he can do it all. And there's a lot of real talent out there, but they only use a seasonal, you know. Um, I remember I had a small part in a movie, and my scene was I'm at a gas station with a blind kid, and these people come by with a double wing plane that needed gas, and then I'm just I fill it up and they leave, and it was a uh, this guy and this young white guy who was about my age. So we're, I'm sitting around the Indian Actors Workshop in L.A., and everybody's talking about the parts they have and this and that. And I said, I would like to play that, that, that lead with the white kid's part. It doesn't matter if he's native or not. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. I mean, you got to think out of the box, you know. I mean, wow. So um, anyway, that's what it is. I don't know if I'm babbling enough yeah. if I start to repeat what, the album what, again. <laughs> Go ahead. What, Go on. Hold on. I, I did want to ask you sure. what, it, what it meant for you to be back home to come. And I didn't realize your, it was going to be your childhood home. I, I knew it yeah. was the Hill Place, but yeah. I, I thought it maybe oh. it was a more recent acquisition. <laughs> no. Um, what does it mean for you to be back home in Oneida Territory? And um, I, I love being home. Um, I used to come home more often, but when I do, I have to stay in the house where I grew up in. It feels like I'm centered. To me, this is the center of the universe for me. This is where my dad came from and his dad. This was a farm a long time ago. And I just feel so relaxed as soon as I come in here. It's just a great feeling in here. As years went on, my, my brother Rick, uh, Chairman Rick Hill, so I guess I'm chair brother, but, but <laughs> he... Um, 
he he remodeled as it went on as my dad started to do it and Rick continued it and I just feel so so peaceful here and I love coming here and and I'm doing a lot of writing more than I ever had in my life uh, I know how to write my act and stuff but I'm learning how to be a writer writer to put it out there and working on that book that Vine inspired me to write and I just like to sit here and all these ideas come and maybe it's all the spirits in the room or what have you you know uh, if you got a second, I want to show a picture of my dad. I, yeah. Just keep that running. It's right here. Right. So being home, I was talking about my dad. And this is, uh, is that close enough? This is my dad and my mom. Oh, oh all right. right there, yeah. My father, uh, he dressed like this every day, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> my father was... Uh, Indian leader here, and he was known all over the country. And my mom was a Cree from Alberta. So when I started out, both both um, uh, countries would, would claim me because there's no border. There's no border. So my mom, like she said, behind every tree there's a Cree. And my dad was um, oh Mohawk and Oneida. Traditionally, I'm supposed to be with, with um, my mother is, but I was raised Oneida, so I'm on the Oneida rolls. But my dad would always... Uh, he was a very funny guy, and he would tell jokes, and and my mom would just stare at him. Tilt it, there yeah. you go. Okay. Yeah, good. And then when my mom would be around a gathering of family people, she'd repeat the joke and get a big laugh with it. And from my mom, I learned how to talk 20 minutes without stopping. That, that's what she was good at. So my parents really, really, you know, I got, my mom was in the city, my dad came from the res, so there's both of that in me. So, uh. So that's that's what I think about a lot, you know. So I don't know if you got that in there. Or yeah, shiny. Okay. we got a little reflection going now and yeah. then. But Norbert Senior. Yeah. That's Norbert Hill Senior. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And I'm real proud that being home, they have the Norbert Hill Center. It used to be the Sacred Heart Cemetery, and I remember as a kid we'd sneak in the woods and swim in there, and they didn't want us around there. And then they did some legal research, and they found out that place was like everything else swindled and stolen from us so we took it to court and it turned out that you know we, it's ours and I remember the diocese in Green Bay going well that's that's our building we have buildings on it. my dad says you can have the damn building we just want our want our uh, land and uh, so the church uh, relented and we have it but they made it look like they gave it to us but it was already ours and what I love was they had that picture of Jesus out in the front and it's gone. It's like they took that statue of uh, uh, Saddam Hussein down. Remember that? <laughs> anyway, uh, it is called Norbert Hill Center, which I love. It's named after my dad, and I'm real proud of that. Um, Jesus, I think. Uh, I think if Jesus came around today, he would say, "You know, I'm part Cherokee." I think he would. <laughs> Yeah, that's it, man. Yeah, so I don't know, but but like I'm saying, it's a real blessing to be home and see people that uh, you grew up with, and also when you grow up on the res, if you make a mistake or do something silly as a kid, they hold you to it the rest of your life. You know, you I know you get that when you go home, and it's like or they call you by a nickname you grew up with, and so and they also make you uh you stay in line, they keep you in line, you know. So when I, when I travel around the country and I see my white buddies, I say, you hear Jim Thorpe? Oh, yeah, we know who he is. I said, well, if he was an Oneida, he would have just been average. I said, he'd have made the team, but but we were all were better than him. <laughs> and they're looking at me like, what? you know. So uh, I said, he was fast around the white people because uh, nobody could keep up to him. But, yeah. <laughs> so then there's, uh, I think there's a lot of Jim Thorpes in this country. They just don't have the opportunities or maybe the desire but I, I'd see people on this res are great athletes but they never left and I'd see guys playing in their 50s even big heavy guys and I'm thinking just think what they could have did with training you know and as it is we're seeing people get out there now there's that guy uh, Ells Ellsbury Ellsworth the Navajo he's, he's on the White Sox he, he yeah. led the league in stolen bases what is it Ellsworth, Ellsworth. Oh, I, I don't know I don't follow the yeah, Sox yeah 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 but uh, and then there's that. Uh, there's a pitcher too, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, Chamberlain. He's on the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. And we've had them over the years. Uh, 
parts of you know Indian athletes everywhere. So it it was it was pretty cool. There was an Ojibwe in the Hall of Fame named Charles Bender. Ali Reynolds. My dad would tell me about all this, and I'd look into it. And and uh, years ago, they finally restored Jim Thorpe's medals, and my dad said, "I can't go, but here's the tickets," because it was in L.A. And I go there, and I see some of the Thorpe family, and he was married a few times, so he had there were some people there that looked like him, and there was uh, Dagmar, who was an activist, was a friend of mine. And then there was Grace Thorpe, who was an activist. So they're all in this room. And in the corner, all these reporters are mobbing Burt Lancaster. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. It's like, it's like if Moses came back, they're going to mob Charlton Heston. You know. So so uh, I think that's a film that could be remade easily. And it'd be real interesting. Because they never really got into how... You're talking about living in both worlds. He, he, he went into the white world and kind of ate him up. That's why he started drinking, and he, he got away from his, his Indian roots. And and at the same time, there was a Hopi named Louis Tawanama, and he won the Olympics with Thorpe as a distance runner. But he went back to the to um, the Hopi way, and he lived as, as a traditional way. He lived a long time. So that, that's an example. you got to get back to where you are, you know. But also with Jim Thorpe, I don't think he was trained to live in... Uh, I mean, after he got done with sports, he wasn't schooled enough to do something else and what have you. But still, people are proud of him no matter what tribe you are, because that was it. He, he was the best. But out no night, I hated been average. No. <laughs> <laughs> Here he got his ass kicked to Menominee. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so the other thing, too, is I was talking about fear people that are Indians. I remember years ago, some white buddies of mine were telling me they, they came through Oneida and their car broke down. It was winter. And they're afraid to go into the White Eagle because they heard the reputation of it. You know, like a two-fight minimum or something. <laughs> they were afraid to go in there. And I said, you know, if you went in there, you'd have seen guys playing darts, shooting pool. But they just had that, that mental luggage that, that, oh, my God, we're going to get our ass kicked. So they decided to wait and freeze in the car until AAA came. What idiots. Idiots, you know. But then again, the reverse of that is, is Indians, you don't want to break down a Shano. Jesus Christ, you know. But, but I think most of America, they're talking about the red, ne red and blue states, redneck states. And I think most of America is redneck. It really is. And when there's Indian communities around these borderline towns, that racism is still there. You know, and um, I saw in the paper today, somebody, I forgot what state it was, he shot a black guy and dragged him ten miles in his in his back of his truck, and then it said the police are trying to determine if it was a hate crime. What the hell? <laughs> I don't know. Crimes, hate crimes. But my God, so no, no, we just dragged this guy for the hell of it. <laughs> so there's that, you know. I think too. It wasn't a few years ago. Some guy, Asian guy, was out in the woods deer hunting, and he got in the wrong property, and no, he and he started to defend himself. And I think they put him away because he, I, I know he didn't get a fair trial, but these are on those redneck crackers. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you look at the guy's history, he was a family man and well-schooled and whatever. But when those rednecks came after him, I mean, he defended himself. And, and, uh, well, that's what happens, you know. So, whatever his name is, um, on your side, brother. Yeah. Yeah, he shot six, six of them, killed six of them, I think. He did? Yeah. Wow. It's a good shot. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Payback's a bitch. <laughs> they were saying they were, they were running away and he was picking them mm. off. Well, you know, they shot at him first. Yeah, that's what they so said. So he went back and, uh, hey, you know. So, um. <laughs> <clears throat> I remember uh, when Floyd was getting sick and he'd go between getting well or not and the doctor said to me once, well, he's he's improving but he's not out of the woods yet. I so, said, well, he's Indian. He should be in the woods. You know, I was wondering about that expression. He's, he's not out of the woods yet. Well, you're supposed to be in the woods. <laughs> oh, my God. Does that mean he's doing better? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so also, that's, that's a other thing, too, is when you're around Native people, at least for me, um, that's just a source of material. People... 
Indian people have the best sense of humor in the world. And I think that's what made us survive all this stuff. The parallel would be the Jewish people. They, they endured a lot of things. And the original comedians in America were, were Jewish. And predominantly the comics are Jewish. And I think it's a lot, they, like us, they came from an oral tradition. And they have their own point of view and everything. And, and I've met lots of them, of course. Uh, lots of them. I sound like a white man. <laughs> um, Jewish people have just been in the comedy world. And and the parallels are amazing. Besides the obvious persecution, oral tradition, Jewish mothers are just like Indian mothers. They they just kill you with kindness, make sure you eat, make sure you're educated, and and their beliefs go back probably the beginning of time like ours, and it's oral tradition, and their prayers are the original ones that go back, and in the native community is the same thing, you know, and and so also the Jewish people never force their religions on us. You know, and I asked a friend of mine at that, Nelly, how come, how come the Jews never did that to us? He goes, if you're not one of us, baby, you're not one of us. I said, well, that's, that's refreshing, you know. So, so uh, I remember one time working in a club in, uh, in Boston. In Boston, it's, we don't have the Ku Klux Klan, we got our own racism. And the joke used to be, this is a comedy club in Boston, and the lineup is Shanigan, Brannigan, Hannigan, O'Reilly, O'Rourke, Rabinowitz. How the hell did he get on there? You know. So anyway, this woman was just, just so angry at me, because I used to do in my act, you all grew up playing cowboys and Indians. Did you never played Nazis and Jews? And uh, she just got so upset with that, and she's going on and on about this, and... I said, I'm not making fun of that. What people were laughing at is the irony of it and be, because uh what went on. Then I told her how Hitler took the swastika from Indians and reversed it and changed the meaning. And he took the idea of uh, reservations and he made it into uh, uh, concentration camps. And I said, if the, if the white people came here and had the same modern technology, they wouldn't have hesitated to use that on us. And she just wouldn't hear no part of it. And I'm thinking... She has no idea that tomorrow I'm actually going to go to a friend's bar mitzvah. And she thought I was this big anti-Semite. And, and, and a, a friend of mine, the uh, brother Lou Gerwitz, was, was a real defender of Indian people and an attorney. And he said to me, what that woman was doing was, I'm superior to you, so my oppression is superior. You know, so she just didn't get it. But I tend to think she was probably offended at my whole act. And that was her reason to go after me, you know, so... If I don't offend anybody, then I didn't do my job. That's how I look at it. You know. So, yeah, yeah, you got something there. <laughs> <laughs>